Please join me in welcoming William Christie and John Halpern. Just uh, by way of preface, say what we're going to do or think we're going to do, because our friend uh, Maestro Christie is a great improviser. So what he says he's going to do may he may not happen, but but nevertheless we're we're going to chat uh, for about seven or eight hours, and um, <laughs> and then um, we we're going to intersperse a little chat with. Um, uh, extracts from some of the emblematic productions uh, Bill's done here, BAM, uh, over the over the years. Um, he's actually done. Could I, I did a little count? Uh, twenty-six, so roughly twenty-six productions here. The, some of them have been concerts, but 26 times here at uh, Brooklyn, which is kind of record, really. It's, it's more than Lou Reed has done. <laughs> and you, it doesn't get much better, Bill. So uh, the, the uh, point is that all of that began uh, in 1989 uh, with Artis. Uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully's artiste. And the, the point of stressing that is, is, is simply that that was the beginning of everything, uh, wasn't it, uh, Bill? That at, at that time, no one knew Baroque music. No one knew you particularly, uh, here anyway, that it was a new phenomenon. Uh, yeah, I can remember that the uh, it, it was at one of the new, the American newspapers after the the uh, the first performance here at the BAM said yes this is the first time that the 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 great cultural public the great you know the 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 general cultivated musical public in the world uh, has tuned into. Uh, Baroque music. Whether that's true or not, it, it was a little bit sort of exaggerated, but it, there was, yes, there was some truth to that. Um, we were uh, specialists, we still are, but we were essentially making music for, I wouldn't call it the happy few, but the, they certainly were far fewer before Atis than after Atis. And it was Atis, this, this extraordinary production that we did first in Prato, then in Paris, and then in Versailles, and then, and then in New York, thanks to Harvey Lichtenstein um, uh, in 1989 that really, I think, put us on the map and put this music on the map. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, there have been other productions since here, like uh, a season or two ago. There was a marvelous restaging of Artis here. Yeah, so we come here, as, as John pointed out, very often, and it's one of the great joys in my life. And I'm not, I mean, this isn't la flagonnerie, as the French say. Oh, no, try is, not to do well, that. Well, I mean, this is, I mean, just sort of, sort of uh, empty, empty sort of uh, praise. But um, the quality of, of things going on here at the BAM is pretty extraordinary. I mean, in, 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 in every sort of area, be it dance or theater or, or music. And I'm very proud about that, of, of that, you know, that uh, we've been able to bring things that sometimes you couldn't put on elsewhere uh, to the BAM. You know. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you a technical question, which is uh, because it bewilders a lot of people, in, including me, which is um, in opera, there's a great maestro, yourself, and there's this guy called a director, you see. And who, who rules? Who decides what? Well, um, it kind of depends, I think, uh, on the country we de we're dealing with. Um, oh. um, there are uh, traditions that have been now sort of um, um, uh, that you'll f well theatrical sort of convention traditions in places like Germany, where I frankly can say that I think that the stage director has become too powerful. Um, whereby you know you can take a Mozart opera and say, fine, I as the director, uh, I'm going to take out all the recitative. I'm going to reorder some of the arias, and frankly, I don't like this one, so I'm just going to take it. You know, that happens. Um, 
I, a, a quick but amusing uh, anecdote. Um, I was to do a number of years ago uh, the coronation of Popea of Monteverdi, which is a great masterpiece, not only musically, but, it, but also in terms of its libretto. And I found myself with a, a great figure of European sort of stage direction who said to me at one point, um, I don't like this mix of comedy and tragedy. Let's get rid of the comic figures. They're, you know, they, they're, they're frankly, they're, they're, they're boring. Well, fine. And then at one point he said, you know, I want this to be a human drama, so I'm going to, could we sort of perhaps sort of minimize the roles of the gods and the goddesses? Such, and, I, and I said, well, that's lovely to hear, but you know, how are we going to sort of convey to Seneca, the great philosopher, and of course the, the tutor of, of Nero, that he's <laughs> essentially, he's, um, he's had it. Uh, or how do we sort of, you know, at the end sort of figure out, uh, you know, what's to be done with mm. Nero and, and Popea and all this without the intervention, of course, of Venus and her son Cupid. And at, well, at that point I gave up um, mm. and we found somebody else. Um, but this does happen. Yes. Um, I've been a, f a very fortunate fellow because essentially, uh, because I've got a, uh, what the French call a caractère de cochon, which means I've got a, I've got a, I'm a difficult human being, I want to sniff around the, the, the stage director before I actually say yes. And um, I've, my track record's pretty good in the sense that I've sniffed around and I've found the people that I've, I want to work with more often than the people I don't want to work with. And it's a question essentially of me wanting to be part of his world as the stage, as the music director, and wanting him to be <coughs> interacting with me as the musical director. Hmm. Well, I know that uh, a number of you will be seeing uh, David and uh, John Atas this afternoon, if we finish in time. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you won't be seeing it. <laughs> but but, but uh, just, so just a couple of questions which yep. relate to what, what, what we're just talking about. For, for instance, the interpretation of that, which seems to have caused uh, a lot of interest, that, that the, the gay aspect of, of it. Who, who decides cause that? Because it's, it's, it, one could imagine in the you will know of productions uh, of of the piece that that have had a, a platonic relationship. Well, we're dealing with a piece actually, which of course was written for a Jesuit college, a Jesuit um, a, a Jesuit boys' school. Um, mm. The subject was, I suppose, um, uh, as um, well as as perhaps as as, um, as provocative back then in 1680 that it was today. Uh, although one dealt with these issues of, of same-sex uh, relationships uh, perhaps in a different way. But certainly um, no Frenchman of the 1670s or 80s could listen to this music of Charpentier and say to himself, mm, yes, it's devoid of all sort of romantic and even sort of erotic interest. I mean, if you take a look at what Charpentier did with his opera Mede, well, when Mede's in pretty sort of, you know, close, um, close contact with her boyfriend Jason, um, well, the music's the same as one finds uh, uh, in the opera David et Jonatas and, and in the moments between David and his young friend Jonatas. Um, how does one deal with this? Well, jokingly, uh, Andreas Homoki said at one point when we were just starting out talking about the, the, uh, the staging and the music, he said, well, to be on the safe side, I could turn Jonathan into an Israeli female soldier. <laughs> you know, about sort of 1955 or so, 1960, you know, when... You know. But he said, that's not very honest, is it? No. So we said to our, uh, each other, look, we're going to play this piece as an honest piece of biblical history. Uh, it's one of the not the only moments, but it's a moment uh, in, uh, in the Old Testament where this extraordinary love affair between two young men happens. Uh, you might like it, you might not like it, but the fact is it's there, you see. And I think we've played it essentially following a text. You know, you can embellish a text, but you can also essentially um, give life to words and to a gorgeous text. And we've not gone any further than that. We've not gone any further than the music wants to be taken. 
either. That's to say, when the music becomes immensely sensual and immensely sort of emotional, which you, will, uh, you who come to know this afternoon will, 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 will witness, we accompany that with gesture and image, you see, that I think is appropriate. Uh, we could have gone much further. Some of you have, have been, I think, to recent productions in New York, where, for one reason or another, they've taken old music, music of Italians or French, whatever, and they've turned them into something which is very, sort of, uh, well, topical and sort of contemporary, but it goes too far for me, you see. I'm not a sensationalist. Um, I don't need nudity. I don't need sort of this or that, you know, which is going to sort of essentially sort of help the music, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the electric shock thing. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Um, the beauty of this piece is the beauty of words, the beauty of the emotion that these words convey, and how the music helps all this out. Yeah, perfect. It's not overt, actually, anyway, having seen the production. It's... It, it's um part of the texture of the piece. It's not made. You haven't built a Taj Mahal around the fact that, that they are obviously, if not in love, love each other and yeah. adore each other. It's obvious yeah. that um, that was so historically, they say. And uh, let's hear now, uh, let's see, the, watch the video of uh, Atis, if we can. And there are three, three little extracts. They're just a taste um, from uh, uh, various scenes in it, and we'll, we'll run all three at the same time. It only takes two or three minutes. Can we take a look? Yeah, we can take a look.
um, you're thrust into another world, aren't you? Really, with the Baroque, it's not nothing. It's it seems to be come from another planet, quite frankly. Well, one is thrust into another world when you take a look at this piece. Right. You see, um, it's a world that we like because we associate it with historical things and with things we see in museums. I, I like this. I think it's marvelous to see historic dance. I think it's wonderful to see wigs <laughs> and, um, and, um, and 18th century, 17th century costumes and all that. But I think the <coughs> point that I would like to make when I see things like this is that the music touches us. And if it touches us, then it's somehow it's, it's, it's contemporary. Um, um, if I close my eyes, this music makes sense as well. Uh, it, uh, I listen to it musically and I listen to the words and um, it's got something to say to people today. That's important to say as well. Sure. It's not only just, you know, the old days of, of um, you know, of, uh, concerts by candlelight and sort of, you know, um, and, uh, and powdered wigs. Yeah. Which is, again, if you come today, you'll see a piece that was written roughly about the same time, but mm. actually is resolutely visually modern. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost a study in uh, internal madness in many ways. Yes. Um, uh, I want to come now to, to uh, Les Arts Florissant, your own troupe, yes. uh, which was founded by you in... Uh, does Les Arts Florissant mean flourishing arts, doesn't it? Um, the title of my oh. lovely uh, child, um, I call it, um, les Arts Florissants, it means the flourishing arts, and it comes from a small opera that was commissioned by the cousin of Louis XIV, probably to, um, to make him happy, that's to say her cousin, the king. Uh, why the flourishing arts? Well, it's very simple. This king, Louis XIV, who is arguably a good king, a great king culturally at any rate, um, founded academies. He was besotted by culture. So he founded the Academy of Painting, he founded the Academy of Architecture, he founded the Academy of Poetry, uh, etc. And these all happened, you see, um, in the 1670s. And this piece essentially says, fine, we've got the greatest guy possible because he's given life essentially to us. That's to say, the arts, painting, mm -hmm. sculpture, poetry theater, music, and what have you. And I chose it, obviously, because I wanted to sort of, well, a little bit of a reminder about that. Yeah. Now, um, you're a peculiar fellow in one sense, uh, Bill, that, that you're uh, American-born. Uh, this troupe is based in uh, your, your baby, your child is based in France really, and, and that you're, you're an American-born man who's celebrated in France uh, for uh, rediscovering or revitalizing their own tradition of French music. This is nothing the French normally celebrate. And how do you feel? <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, 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 it's marvelous to be in France and talk about America as a Frenchman. It's also nice to be in the States and speak about French uh, as mm. an American. You're both. And I'm both, mm. which means that I can get snide remarks and sort of, and sort of caustic comments, you know, going, uh, depending on how I feel and what side of the bed I wake up in the morning, how, you know, um, how, I, how I react to, to things. Um, when I first came to France, I was besotted. Um, I was wearing rose-colored glasses, and I have for, a very, for, for many years, just in terms of French culture. I love it. Uh, <coughs> I've loved it since I was a kid. I was helped out by my folks because they loved France, um, and I was helped out just by magic moments, moments that you can't explain. You've all had them, everyone in this room, where all of a sudden, for something, for some particular reason, time stands still, and after that, you're not the same. It happened to me musically when I was young. Uh, when I was seven or eight years old, and I suddenly realized, of course, that music was the most important thing in the world. And then that got refined even more when I, s when I heard my first French piece of music, you see. And then when I heard 
French spoken. And when my parents would come back and say, oh, gosh, you know, that trip down to Toulouse, well, you know, in a few years' time, you'll be there too, you know, sort of thing. Um, Yes. Um, I went to France because I wanted to drink at the source. I wanted to be there, uh, you know, looking at those manuscripts and being in those places, of course, where the composers that I loved when I was younger uh, were were hanging out and making music. Uh, I went off for what I thought was going to be a short stay in 1970, (laughs) <laughs> but I'd never come back. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, is, is w- what you just mentioned about the, the composers themselves, that, that you've revitalized the, the Baroque movement, French Baroque movement in particular, and that, that means you excavated that work that was either museum-fied, uh, part of the establishment, or ignored out of fashion or totally. not not and and uh, if if you if you have a score that no one else has seen in 200 years how how do you deal with that i mean it's just notes on a page isn't it well this is a, this is a, this i suppose this is the this is the, the the essential problem how do you give music life and how do you give old music that hasn't been op- op- hasn't opened up its mouth, so to speak, new eloquence. Um, well, it's very simple. If I, a hundred years ago, if I were doing Lully or Charpentier or Rameau, uh, let's say we're, we're now about 1900 at, at in the Paris scene. You know, I'm, I'm a conservatory graduate from, Har- uh, from, from the Paris Conservatory. It's 1901, <coughs> let's say, and I'm about to prepare a production for the Opéra de Paris. What do I do? Well, I First of all, I don't have a real proper score. So um, I'd have to rely, if I were working with, with, uh, on Rameau, on pretty corrupt scores. Scores that were made by people maybe uh, 20 years before in the 1880s or 90s, but essentially people who, well, what were they listening to? They were listening to Massenet. They were listening to Gounod. Uh, they were listening to Bizet. All of them great composers, you see. But how do you, you know, when you start to apply performance techniques and instrumental playing and singing styles that are better suited for, you know, the, the Messe de Saint-Cécile of Gounod or uh, Saint and Delilah of the Opera of Saint-Saëns uh, or a Werther of, of Massenet, what happens? The music can't stand it, you see. In other words, we were applying, our, our, our grandparents or our great-grandparents were essentially trying to make this music of Lully and Charpentier uh, uh, using tools that were better adapted for music much later. What's happened over the last sort of 50 years or so is we've realized that there are ingredients that are important to make this music come to life. Instruments, old instruments. If you come tonight, or if you've been coming to my concerts, you, f- you realize that I'm part of this movement which uses copies or extend instruments of the period. Why? Well, because it helps us at least get a little bit closer to the intentions of a composer. If we know a little bit about the sound that he heard back in 1700 or 1650, it would seem to me that's, that's already a little bit better than using instruments you know, that are better adapted you know, for, playing, for playing Rachmaninoff or playing whatever. Mm. And then, um, but there's the whole idea of scholarship. Um, can an American musicologist <coughs> working in Berkeley, California in 1965, I bring that, 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 that bit of information to you because that was a great center of French studies. Can these people help me and ultimately then help you uh, bring back this music to life and, and then purvey it to you? The answer is yes, yes. Scholarship, and the, the happy thing, of course, is, the happy thought is, it's largely American scholarship over the last 50 years, which has helped me out. Um, how? Well, um, take a look at, for example, well, vocal style. Do we know how people sang in, in 1680? No. And that's, that's, that sounds like a bad sort of start off. But no, we don't. We don't have a recording. No, we don't have a recording. But we do have treatises, and we do have contemporary accounts of what, you know, what people sounded like, and what people liked, and also what this, 
you know, how they were aiming to please their audience. We know, for example, that if you couldn't really pronounce a text properly as a singer, and singers were called harmonic orators, by the way, um, you didn't, you know, you weren't considered very good. So all these ingredients, you see, have added up, essentially, to something which I think is, has helped us out. Um, we'll never, ever be able to say, you know, we're doing it exactly the way Charpentier or Rameau wanted it. But we can say now, we've got a few tools and a few sort of ideas that allow us at least to get a little bit closer to his intentions. And that's important. And it somehow seems to have unlocked this music, you see. That's important. Okay. We'll we'll go on to the next uh, video. Tell me if I'm uh, talking too long. No, you're not talking too long. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a centrality of of, of uh, that every every artist, you know, in theatre, a, a director, as you know, of, uh, let's say Shakespeare. The question is, how, what compelled him to write King Lear? Yes. How do you get as close as you can to the creative flame that ignited the piece in the first place? And of course, that's all part of your detective work and, and skill and scholarship and instinct and intuitive powers to, to look at a score that no one has heard in hundreds of years and bring it back to life. Yes? Yes. Good. I understand. That's the <laughs> <laughs> so. We're, com we're coming on now to Jean-Philippe uh, Rameau's, uh, um, how do you pronounce, Hippolyte. Hippolyte et Aïssi. Hippolyte, oh, thank you. And there are just two uh, little sections from, from this, part of the prologue and part of a scene from Act Two. Enjoying these things, so yeah. I mean, actually, well, it wants them to go on, you know. But there we are; we can't. It's just a little taste of these things. I, w I wanted to come back to something you mentioned right at the beginning, which is this uh, collaboration uh, between uh, the, the the musician and the director. No, not specifically, but in a way, you you're, you're there as a participant and spectator because when you look up at the stage you you're looking you're seeing what we're seeing even though you you're fan emotionally completely involved and indeed have a vested interest but i just wondered has the curtain ever gone up and you thought to yourself god almighty what are they doing <laughs> have you ever thought that because i have to confess to you i th feel it frequently um you know oh it's a spaceship you know, <laughs> what, what are they doing? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, <laughs> I've said not your the productions, yeah, Paul, but their I, productions. I'm, I'm. Yeah. Once you've decided to buy into a production, that's to say, once I've, as I say, I've sniffed around my, my yeah. the, the candidate who's going to be doing the, the, the stage directing, and you've decided you've made a decision to, right. to work with him or her. Right. You defend them. Um, and I'll defend them to, to the death. Uh, that doesn't mean that during the process of actually creating uh, a piece with mm -hmm. a stage director, there are sometimes disagreements. 
fights, uh, moments of, of, of discord, and, and, and that happens. But that's, that's great. You know? For example, I, I remember, um, to, to cite someone who I love very much, Robert Carson, I can remember him coming down at one point. He said, you know, if, if, you, if you do this piece in the temple that you're directing it, I'll have half the audience leaving you know, we're, we're in the middle of it. It's boring. You know, <laughs> fine. So we fought that one out, and I, well, he won. Um, but what that means yeah. to say is that when that curtain goes up, I'm part of the production. You know, and you know, I can remember I got this terrible review once. You know, um, awful. Um, it was a piece that I did here, but the review came out in England. Um, Typical. And they can be vicious, as you know. Oh, terrible! Yeah. I, would, yeah. I, uh, I wouldn't go near them. English, <laughs> English reviewers, I can be merciless. Yeah. At any rate, the, the, we had this very contemporary dance company called the La 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 Human Steps from Montreal, and I loved them. But the review came out because it's all sort of, you know, it has a lot to do with finger work and stuff like this. It said, Dear reader, imagine a deaf and dumb institution where the inmates are trying to communicate to each other the fact that the kitchen's on fire. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, it was all sort of, you know, sort of, <laughs> you know, and it had been done artistically. Yes. And the curtain went up mm. that next night, and I thought, what if it's true? <laughs> that was a, a, a very, very, uh, there was, a, there was a, a moment of, I shouldn't mm. have read that review, and then mm. afterwards thinking, ooh, that slob. You know, <laughs> you know how wrong he is, and he's just so, and he's he's not only wicked, but he's 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 mean, and he's horrible. And well, horrible. He's, just, he's not right. Which means <laughs> to say, yes, I would say that I've I've spent yeah. 40 years making music, and when that curtain goes up, yeah. you know, and I'll, if someone, you know, I mean, I I I'm fairly sort of violent in my reactions. The the French, of course, audience goers are not like Americans. Americans show their enjoyment. Or sometimes they show their, but, but if you're, you're, you interact with, with the stage and with the, with, the, with the orchestral pit. And I think that's fabulous. The French can be just horrible. And I have turned around and I've, done, I've given what the French call a bras d'honneur, you know, which essentially is. You know, um, I'm shocked. Well, shocked. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I remember one, one Frenchman uh, shrieking out, he actually stopped the production, saying, Remember the Rameau tradition, and you're making a desecration right. of it all. And, 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 I said, and I said, there is no tradition. I, I, I shot back at him. This was at the Paris Opera. And I said, frankly, mm. the Rameau tradition in France has been dead for years. And so, you know, don't, don't, you know, don't talk to me about Rameau and, and as if somehow, you know, you've been with him for the last, you know, the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> um. I want to I, I want to come now to your 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 <laughs> your roots, you know, your street fighting roots <laughs> that are suddenly emerging. Um, uh, that you were, uh, in fact, uh, you were born in Buffalo. Were you? Is that the beginning of a joke? No, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. <laughs> but you were born in Buffalo, and the fact of the matter is there were there there, there was. Fantastic music in your family, but no musicians. And say a little about that. Well, I'll tell you a funny anecdote, which will make, I, make me, I, I still laugh at it. I went off to France uh, on this very long stay, and, I, and there was a woman uh, at a party that I went to in 1970, and she was kind of glamorous, and she thought obviously she was the cat's meow. And um, she turned to me and she said, I detect a slight accent. And I said, yes, I'm not, uh, I'm not French, actually, I'm American. Ooh, she said, <laughs> and where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Buffalo. And she said, oh, Buffalo, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 no. It's, it's dans l'état de New York. And I said, I made that very apparent that this was New York, you know, no <laughs> buffaloes here. And then she said, and what do you do? And I said, well, I play the harpsichord. Je suis un claveciniste. And she went, and then she left me. <laughs> and I thought, fine. And then she came back, however, about uh, 10 minutes later, and she said to me, essentially, and she had these funny kind of interesting things. She said, you said that you were from Buffalo, and you're a harpsichordist? As if somehow she couldn't, you could never get the two things together. You know? um, 
<laughs> and I think the poor woman still probably said, if she's still alive, you know, is, 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 is she's still in that kind of quandary. Um, right. As it turns out to be, Buffalo is, uh, those of you who do know it, love it. And those of you who don't know it, I'll tell you, it's a pretty wonderful place to come from. Because, yes, um, <coughs> yes, we did listen to music. And yes, the finer things in life, you know, were, yeah. And I was a fortunate guy. And I essentially, and I'm not by, by any means, uh, uh, unique. Uh, I had a grandmother who loved music, right. uh, who gave me my first recordings. I used to sit up in the summertime and, and listen to things that uh, I still, you know, I, th I said, yes, it's wonderful. You know, Bach, did when I was seven or eight, you know. And my ma, who's still alive, 95 years old, uh, conducted a little church choir in our little church, St. Paul's ch uh, Church mm. in Williamsville, New York. And uh, which meant that my house, yes, I heard Bach, and I heard Handel, and I heard Purcell, and I heard, you know, uh, Anglican chant, and I heard, um, yeah, lots of things. And this was a, a very important mo part of, me of my growing up musically. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, not because of uh, Le Buffalo, but uh, how did you come by a harpsichord? Well, I'll tell you, it was very simple. I, my grandma uh, back in... Oh, it's off. Good. This, is, uh, this has all been very much rehearsed. So <laughs> <laughs> it sounded um, more obvious than it was meant I, to be. I can, this is one of these sort of moments, you know, in my life where, you, where things do change, you know. Um, I went off with my, my grandma and my mother. Uh, it was to Kleinhans Music Hall, which is one of the most beautiful places, by the way, in the East. It happened to be built by, uh, by Elio Saarinen in 1938, I believe and it's still as fresh and as, as, as vibrant a place as it was when it was built. And there, just before Christmas, uh, Joseph Krips, remember him? Marvelous Viennese conductor, was conducting with the Buffalo Philharmonic and the Buffalo Choir uh, Messiah. Well, you know, I had never heard Messiah before, but I, I, I saw a man come in, a tall fellow, and he sat down at an instrument that looked a little bit kind of funny, but I didn't quite know what it was. And I heard, after the big overture, <laughs> and then I heard the tenor go, comfort me. And then he tinkled. I was hooked. I really was <laughs> hooked. And I pulled at my grandmother and I said, well, she says, oh, we know him, he's called Squire. I said, Squire? She says, yes, this is Squire Haskin, who then became, of course, a good friend of mine later on, but he was a friend of my family's and he was Buffalo's resident harpsichordist. And I insisted that I go down and I couldn't play it after the performance. But I went home to my house and after a few days, I found that I could sort of approximate the sound that I heard on my, pa my family's Steinway piano by putting thumbtacks in, uh, <laughs> in, the, in the hammers. <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a bad moment. <laughs> um, but the, the point to be made, of course, is that when you hear sounds you've never heard, um, they can be magical. And this was the beginning of this love affair that, you know, that, uh, that brings me to... <laughs> which is the beginning of the Coup Prend Barricade Mysterieuse, which I heard very shortly after. So that's what it's all about, you see. Um, from that moment, um, this is how it all started. Do you think, by the way, that uh, the perfection of recording, since you mention it, it's marvelous to hear you do that, by the way, but do, do you think that the perfection of recordings 
sacrifices something of, of a live performance. Of course it does, but I think that the recordings that we love, but I'll tell you what I love. I love listening to, obviously, um, myself. Um, <laughs> that's to say, what I've done <laughs> with my outfit. I mean, I'd be, I'd be a fool to say it otherwise. Yeah, no, sure. I'm, I'm proud of what I've done. But I also love listening to people who have somehow been able to keep commitment and integrity and spontaneity um, and love and fervor and passion in the recording. When I listened to Wanda Landowska, remember her? Mm. Yeah. Well, those recordings are now 75 years old, her harpsichord recordings, some of them. And I like listening to Andrea Segovia. I like listening to someone like Alfred Deller, uh, one of the great pioneers, of, because somehow what, what really shines through, even if it's not perfection, is, is commitment and total, total love of what they're doing. Um, there are recordings I don't like for that reason, because they're not there. Yeah. Okay, well, <coughs> we're, go we're going to come now to um, two extracts from Charpentier, who um, uh, Marc Antoine Charpentier, who happens to be, uh, I don't want to corner you, but you did say the other day that uh, that uh, you rated Charpentier really uh, the god of gods. Is well, that, um, that within a, within a, a small universe, uh, we uh, John is, is 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 referring to a, 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 a mm. conversation we had about Lully the great Lully, the fellow right. who wrote Atis, uh, amongst other tragedies lyriques, and his contemporary Charpentier. It wasn't a very happy sort of relationship, as we know. Uh, the person who lost out uh, over a, a 20 or 30 <coughs> year period was poor Charpentier, because Lully was a, a, a thug. Um, can you imagine a composer today getting uh, a court order from the Supreme Court saying, um, um, he will have um, sole jurisdiction over the kinds of music written by his, his contemporaries and by his, his colleagues. Mm -hmm. If there's a, a question about him having first digs, you know, um, uh, as, a, as composed in residence at, the, at the, uh, the, the New York Philharmonic or in the, uh, um, in the Chicago Lyric, uh, he gets first digs. And that's the way it's going to be. And was, which meant, of course, that all these poor composers around Lully um, were pretty much sort of, well, they were, yeah. they were, they were yeah. Lulliites. Well, they, they were, they were simply but just, they were condigned, so yes. So uh, the position there is that Charpentier's, uh, a lot of his work was, was pushed to one side because of this because Salieri of type figure. Exact, exactly. Who, who was trying to kill him off. Yes, yes, yes. Right. This, is a pro this was easy in France and still is in a sense uh, because everything is centralized. Lully had the king's favor. And uh, mm. uh, since he had the king's favor, he could do exactly what he wanted. And he had mm. this in writing from the king. You say, mm. you are my favorite composer. We will mm. give you, the, you know, all the benefits. Uh, and mm. uh, find whoever else is around, well, they can just sort of fend for themselves, which is what poor Charpentier did. Okay, so the, these, these are the, uh, this is from Actyon and Medea, and they're two short extracts. Uh, Charpentier. Oh, <laughs> 
something you said, so I hope you said it. Uh, otherwise, we'll have to move on, right? But it was, uh, it's from the New York Times, and it's, uh, so it must be right, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we, we it's, it's uh, from 1995, and it's Edward Rothstein, Rothstein explaining the fundamental, this is you in a master class, explaining the fundamentals of Baroque style. And he says here, Mr. Christie's teaching rests on an almost elementary principle. In the French Baroque repertory, words take precedence over music, and taste takes precedence over nearly anything else. Mr. Christie's version of authenticity is allegiance to the principles of a style. Uh, and so on. But the surprising thing to me about that is um, I do see the, the uh, so please explain, uh, I'm surprised that, that words take precedent over music. Would have thought at least put them on equal footing. But, but well, um, yes, th you know, people who love opera, of course, love mm. voices. Yes? Yes. And uh, let's say the majority of opera people, be they here of in, in Europe um, tend to focus on 19th and early 20th century repertory, which is essentially either sort of Wagner style or bel canto or what have mm. you, or verismo. And there, what do you listen to? You listen to the beauty of a, of a voice. You listen to technical excellence. You know, is, can she do all that coloratura in the, in the Italian, in, in Algeria, of, of Rossini? Uh, um, but do they ever talk about words? Well, I'd... I mean, I, I can remember a few singers I, I, I loved back in the, someone like Joan Sutherland, you know, who, my God, you couldn't, you, I mean, if you told me she was singing Italian sometimes, I'd, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you'd li but you love her. She's a great, she's an, she's an iconic and great artist, you see. There's a difference in, in there's a few periods in, uh, in opera history where the word is as important as the music. One happens to be a great period for me, which is Monteverdi. Uh, and if there were a composer who I would wish to have written more operas, or we, had we well, you know, not lost as many as we did, I'd, he certainly is a candidate. And why do I say this? Because essentially he was gifted with great libretti. But also that was the moment when essentially music drama was theater set to music. 
at the end of the 17th century in France, you've got the same thing. Why, why is Lully a great composer? Well, he's not a great composer, frankly. I'm answering, you know, Charpentier is a great composer musically. But the fact is Lully had a genius, which was to take the greatest theater that we've probably known in the Western world, aside from English Shakespearean theater in the 17th century, which is the theater of people like Corneille, Racine, you see, Molière, uh, writers who are so fabulous that they nev they've never ever lost favor, you see. But they were in there, uh, and we've been, they've been essentially uh, played and played and replayed and, and, and uh, f ever since they, they died three centuries ago. They were in their heyday in the 1670s and 80s. And the genius of Lully was to say, fine, if this is great theater, why don't we sort of make it into a kind of musical theater, whereby we can notate musically the words. And this is something that he created, you see. Now, what this means, of course, is that it's less sung than declaimed. Right. You see? Um, does that mean that uh, singers didn't have to have great voices? Yes. If you went off to hear an opera in France in 1710, let's say you were an Italian. Italians traveled, perhaps more than they do even today. Um, or you were an Englishman. Lots of English traveled to the continent on the Grand Tour. Or perhaps you were one of the Grimm brothers, you know, a little bit later on, coming to Paris, which was, you know, this, the city of lights. And you listened to opera, French opera. Well, the comments were, were, were absolutely uniform. Uh, they don't sing. You know? And there are no arias. You know, they, they say that this little piece that we heard that lasted you know, 30 seconds is called an aria, says the Italians, but there's no coloratura, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no great singing art. This is, this is what it's all about, you see. Now, uh, when Mr. Rothstein talked about that, uh, he's spot on, because what I was saying to my Juilliard kids, I think it was the Juilliard back then, um, was, look, you know, this is a whole different art form. And if you want to sing Charpentier, for example, or even Rameau, you've got to understand that, yes, we go progressively. Once we leave Lully, we come into more vocality. We, we need singers, good ones. But there's always this element, lurking element, which is in French music drama, of the word. And that comes out, you see, in these extraordinary moments of recitatif, where essentially um, we're not singing, we're declaiming. We're talking to you in a kind of a, a, a using a, a voice, but a voice essentially that's not going to sort of liberate itself and sing, uh, you know, a, a great sort of Italian aria mm -hmm. that we would mm -hmm. associate mm -hmm. with, with everything that, that happens afterwards. So, so, so the voice, rather, uh, the, the instrument of the voice, is, 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 is which is used differently. Yes, the voice right. is used mm. essentially to not only convey musical ideas, but to mm. convey the sense mm. that language and words have. Mm. Today, for you know, it's, it's might, might be interesting for you. This is just a little aside. We've listened mm. now to five or six uh, excerpts of, of pieces. It's interesting to know, perhaps, and you, you wouldn't have any way of knowing, that mm. the majority of the singers you've heard today are English or American, singing French. I'm very proud of that, because essentially, we've, we've, I think we've done the priorities correctly. So it's a new language. Yes. But they've understood, of course, that the, the priority is linguistic. Yes. Yeah. So the instrument of the voice is different, just as the instruments themselves are different. Yes. And they have to be relearned, yes. in a way. Yes. Am Technique right? for this kind of music, and those mm. of you who come tonight will understand this perfectly well after a few measures, mm. the technique is something which requires specialization. This is why, for example, we've set up this fantastic new uh, department at the Juilliard School of Historic Performance. Mm. Good. We're coming now to... Uh, uh, Handel, a short extract from Orlando, um, and then we'll do uh, probably go straight on really to two extracts from. How are we doing? Very well. Oh, <laughs> got lots of time. <laughs> um, uh, two extracts from Purcell, which are Dido and Aeneas, and probably a 
favorite of a lot of people here, the Fairy Queen. So we'll, we'll do those three on the run, if we may. like to dance, don't they? Yes. Kings like dance as well, didn't they? They, they liked uh, a lot of dance. They like to join in. 
Yeah, could you imagine Francois Hollande, our, our president, actual president, <laughs> dancing, or for that matter, doing anything cultural? I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, the fact is that back in those days, of course, yeah, kings danced, and um, yes, I mean, even your kings danced for a while. I mean, the, the Which the one? Well, the Stuarts, before the Hanoverians. Before guy. my time. Yeah. <laughs> 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 current this ones. This is Thatcher wasn't <laughs> on the dance floor. No, no, yeah. no, nor the current royal family. But there we are. Um, uh, you, you may have noticed on, on the last one, uh, there were a couple of people, on the, you could hear them coughing. And then they, they stopped immediately. And the reason they did that, Bill, is because you, I believe you climbed out of the orchestra pit and physically <laughs> put, <laughs> strangled them. The truth of the matter is, you're a very sensitive uh, chap, rightly in my view, uh, to people who cough. You've been known in mid-beat, uh, as it were, to turn round and give the offender the look of a dead albatross, really, <laughs> so that they be shut up, really. So, uh, why? obviously, you do it for an obvious reason, but, but why, why is it that, of course, we're probably all dying to cough now, but, <laughs> but, but why is it that people cough all the time? Uh, uh, what, what is it with them? I mean, uh, between movements, you see, the back I goes down, we but is was coughing. What, was what? this one of the questions that we... we, we we this prepared. Is a, this is a new question. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming left field, and, and it's, it's meant, you know, you can, you can answer it. For, for example, you could say that the theory that Handel is superior to all uh, Baroque performers, particularly of Handelians, which has nothing to do with coughing, but you may <laughs> like to comment on that. Do you think, uh, what do you think of Handel people who see themselves as separate from the Baroque movement uh, in the way that certain artists uh, didn't want to belong to movements either? Uh, do you want me to talk about Handel or coughing? Both. <laughs> but I sense a reluctance for you to talk about coughing, but it's well, entirely someone, up to you. Someone uh, many years ago, <laughs> talked to me about a concert that he'd gone to hear at Carnegie Hall, one of these mm. Sunday afternoon sort of concerts, you know. Yeah. And um, there was a woman who was coughing her lungs out in front of him. And uh, so he tapped her on the shoulder very gently, and uh, she turned around. She was uh, uh, getting on to elderly. And he said, the music's lovely, isn't it? And he, uh, she said, yeah. And he said, um, could you perhaps not cough as loudly um, and she turned to him and said, young man, I've been coughing here for 40 years. <laughs> 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 yeah. And I, I'm not, this is not a, a, a joke, but I, I'm, and I don't remember saying it, but I, uh, when I was in Glenbourne years ago, there was an awful human being just behind me, literally just behind me, and it's a small, it's a small hall. And it, I think she should have been in hospital. And... Um, I turned to it and I said, I apparently I said, this is an auditorium and this is not a sanatorium. <laughs> and um, um, she wasn't there after the long interval. And she did write a letter, I know, to, oh. to, John, uh, to, uh, to George Christie really? uh, complaining. And he <laughs> refunded her money, which I thought was wonderful. And said something about, um, you know, when you get better, do come back or something like that. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. I'll tell you about coughing. Uh, first of all, an audience that is engaged in, uh, well, first of all, the early music audience coughs less. Uh. It does. The coughers, have you, I'll tell you, go off to La Scala uh, or go off to uh, Fenice mm. in Italy when they're, you know, when they're putting on one of their big pot boilers, you know, a, you know a, an Aida or a, uh, you know. Mm. Um, the coughing is pretty d d d disastrous. Are there differences in coughers between Germans and uh, French <laughs> and English? Yes, 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 yes. You go off to the, the, the Philharmonic in, in, in Berlin and you're conducting the, the, the Berlin Philharmonic and people don't cough. They don't cough, you know. You go off to Wigmore Hall 
for a leader recital or for an early music recital, and my God, I mean, people would, would, they, would they would asphyxiate themselves rather than, 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 than let a cough out, you know? Right. You go off to uh, the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées in Paris, which is a kind of an upper-middle-class sort of, you know, fancy neighborhood sort of theater, people cough. <laughs> yes. 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 So, they so there's there their, their, their regional, uh, country, <laughs> cultural uh, differences yes. in, the, in the cough. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who knew? <laughs> who knew? I can write a book on it. <laughs> yeah, I should, you know. <laughs> You're obviously a student of the form. But... Uh, <laughs> But um, uh, the, the little thing I tried to get you to so no, handle, handle, handle. The, 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 the they, you know, do not prefer to be separate from. Well, no. Or maybe I mean, I'm talking to the wrong Handelians. Could be. Well, I mean, how do you do? How do you define a Handelian? A Handelian is someone who loves. Fanatic. Basically. Yeah, but then you, know, you get like Wagnerians. Yes, you get you get fanatic Wagnerians, but you're also now getting fanatic Ramist. That's to say, people who like Rameau, or you're getting fanatic sort of people who like French grand opera. They're we're, we're less numerous. How I mean, I'm I'm a Vag uh, I'm a, I'm a Wagner and I adore Wagner, but I also mm. love Handel as well. And I suppose I I I, I qualify as being a a Handelian. Um, I could do Handel along with Purcell, with Monteverdi, Mozart. Uh, I could Charpentier. I could do Handel every day of my life. Mm and be a happy man. Why do I love him? Well, because he talks to me. He speaks, he speaks to me. He touches me. I, I've, I think I've pretty much chosen, I mean, the people that I've just mentioned are, to use an old-fashioned word, but I think it's still very relevant, they're humanists. They believe in the human, in the human nature and in, and in human goodness and in, human, and in everything that, that humans have done, essentially. And they believe in in the things that make humans noble, uh, yes, um, and they uh, this is a great quality I think in art. You know, it makes me, for example, want to say yes. I know why uh, Handel collected Rembrandts. You know, Handel. Well, first of all, he could because he made a lot of money, but he he also had a deep feeling for art, and it's curious that it's the art of that I associate with great humanism, someone like Rembrandt, you mm. see. And I think it's great that somehow the two of them were living cheek to jowl, you know. Here in his house on Brook Street, he could look up and see a Rembrandt portrait. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, nicely said. Thank you. Um, the, I want to just mention, uh, because it's not just uh, where you live, although you have a place in Paris, but you also have this wonderful house uh, in uh, Thierry, in, in uh, uh, the south of the Vendée in France. Is that near Brittany or in Brittany? Well, if, if you take uh. a look at the west coast of France, where we're mm. talking about this wreck of a house that I've restored, uh, mm. late 16th century house, and especially the garden around it, which I created, mm. uh, it's actually close to La Rochelle, which it is it's about halfway down on the west coast. If you take you know, Brittany up here and the Spanish mm. border down here, I'm sort of here. Mm. And and uh, how many? Well, in uh, just in terms of the gardens, how many acres do you have? About I have too many in the sense that my mm. my uh, uh, I I love gardens. I've loved gardens mm. always uh, for all my life, um, and they they are my second passion. Um, I've been too ambitious, so I'm now I'm cutting back. But the garden, to answer your question directly, is. Uh, the e extensive cultivation, let's just say the clipping, you know, and the yeah. boxwood hedges and the um, and all that, um, is about about two and a half acres. And it's a classical garden. It's not an unruly romantic garden. Am I right? No, I'm <laughs> looking at my watch because I mean, it, 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 this really requires some explanation. No, yeah. it's not classical. It's me. Um, oh. In the all sense right. that it's exactly the way I make my music, you know. Um, uh, you start out by learning the ropes, learning, the, you know, defining the perimeters, as I said, you know, with the doing your homework, your musicological mm. work, instruments and what have you, treatises, historical mm. work, archaeology, musical archaeology. And then your input personally is very important. My garden, uh, if you were kind to my garden, you'd say, as some garden writers are, 
Christie has created a very personal garden. Uh, it's eclectic. It, uh, the references are the French and Italian gardens of the 17th century, uh, but there's a strong dose of you know, American arts and crafts, you know, the Beatrix found, and they, you know, all that, and the, and the English, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, the, post, uh, the post Victorian sort of garden sort of school in England, the Gertrude Jekylls and all that. Um, and if you're less kind, uh, and a few outriders have been, they'll say, well, this is a kind of a mishmash of, of styles. Um, it's Christie, uh, it's, a, it's a Christie folly. Well, it is. Uh, but then again, as I say, it's like my music in the sense that I'm, I'm now uh, able, and I'm, well, I'm, I've got the courage to say that, yeah, it's Charpentier or it's Lully, but I suppose it's kind of Christie Charpentier or Christie Lully or Christie Rameau, which it has to be, you see. This is a complex, but it's not complex, uh, discussion. It, it simply means that Baroque music, one of the lovely things about it is that it's open-ended. It means that for me to make this music, I've got to complete the score. The score isn't complete. There's so much lacking, you know. Um, when Handel writes the score, or Rameau, or Coupra, or whoever, you see, the, the, the part that the interpreter has to play in terms of fleshing out the continual line, adding ornaments, maybe, sort of, you know, that's enormous. And it means, of course, that the composer is helped out by the composer the interpreter far more, for example, than, well, let's take a score of someone like, um, well, like one of Charpentier's successors, like Pierre Boulez, who's still alive. I, 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 I start out a kind of a shock lecture to my students at the Juilliard or wherever. Uh, I, I take a piece, one page of, of Boulez, and I take a page of Rameau, and I say, now count the number of, of just things that you have to sort of obey in the Marteau Son Maître, you know, of Boulez. That's to say dynamics or uh, tempo or what have you. We counted 72 indications of something on one page. And the page of Rameau is nothing. You don't even know which instruments are playing. <laughs> you don't know what the tempo is like. You don't know what the dynamics are. You don't know what instruments, you know, in, and, but that's, that's part of the course, you see. And my garden, in a sense, is in the, same, in the same vein, you see. I've taken historical things, and yet my input's pretty big. Yeah. Do you talk to your plants, by the way? I talk to my garden every day, yeah, via my gardener. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially yeah. when I'm in New York. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, the, the lovely point is that every summer now you, you, you have all these uh, kids and young musicians come along and you have a kind of music festival over two or three days in the grounds, am I right? Well, yeah, this, this I suppose is one of the nicest things that's happened to me is now a kind of getting on sort of uh, musician. Um, I created this garden in 1987. From nothing, there was. I mean, the the garden had uh, the house had been lived in. Believe it or not, this is something that, that Americans, uh, well, even when I was uh, down there, I found extraordinary. This house was a rental farmhouse from 1640 to 1983. That's to say, the house was never lived in by its owners, except for very, very for at the very beginning, at the late 16th century, and it was lived in by people who lived in utter poverty. Uh, but they were happy in the, in the sense that it's a generous place to be in terms of the climate and what have you. But can you imagine a house of about 15 or 17 rooms where countless generations lived in two or three rooms? Um, and when I found the house, it was that, you see. Um, uh, they were farmers as they, all their predecessors were. And sometimes these families, these farm families, these rental, these tenant farmers, we had three or four generations before they, you know, another, another family picked up the, the place. The, the, there was no garden around the house. I mean, essentially, like a lot of farm people, they hated things that grow other than what they could get money for. So they essentially did their gardening with, with, um, with, 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 uh, with, uh, with Roundup or whatever they call that stuff, mm -hmm. that, you know. Yeah, there was nothing around. And I, but that's what I wanted, you see. I wanted to create something from scratch. And the idea of creating this garden, of course, in my mind, was music. 
I wanted to create a, music, a, a garden where I could make music, and a garden that had essentially references to music. Why? But, but because gardens are terribly important in, in the music of the 17th and 18th century, which is my great love. You can't find an opera, uh, be it Italian or English or French, that doesn't talk about gardens in the 18th or 17th century, you see. And we know also, and this is a beautiful thing to, to, to remind oneself, that people made music in gardens. And one of the happiest moments of my life was this last summer when we had, for the first time, music in my garden. And we had, um, on the water course, we had uh, Aces and Galatea of Handel every night, you know, on a floating stage. Uh, the way Handel would have written the piece, because it was written for the out of doors. And then during the day, we had 17 concerts a day, small ones, 10, 15, 20 minutes, given by the Juilliard students, or our young musicians, in different parts of the garden. So the, the Red Garden, and the Chinese Bridge, and the, the Green Theater, and the Cloister, and the, the, the Wall of Cyclops, uh, and the Big Terrace. Uh, you could promenade, you could walk, you could sort of just uh, visit parts of the garden and hear music the way it was done back then. And a marvelous woman got up. She was about maybe one of 30 people uh, down by the Chinese bridge listening to a brilliant young lute player, half American, half French, by the time of the name of Thomas Dunford, and two gorgeous uh, gals singing French air de cour, French court songs. Um, and she got up, and she happened to be the old director of the Bibliothèque Nationale, as to say, the public library, the great national library. And she turned to her, these people she didn't know, and she said, I'm in tears because this is the first time I've heard this music the way the composer wanted it to be heard. That's to say, when he went off to the great houses, like vaux le vicomte uh, or even Versailles, he didn't want this music to be sung in a great gilded salon. He, wants to, he wanted it to be sung in what she used, the French word, dans les bosquets. A bosquet is simply a kind of a shady glen or a, an outdoor place where people can feel very sort of protected uh, and comfortable. And that moved me terribly, you see. Um, and th it was a howling success, uh, this festival. And... Um, if you're in France at the <laughs> end of the summer, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> this coming summer, <laughs> yes. uh, in a few months' time, mm. uh, come to our festival. Uh, it's open to the public. We've had a lot of Americans come last year for the first time, and I hope there are going to be more. Uh, the attraction, of course, is that it's not only French, but it also is American, in the sense that we've got the Juilliard School from here, 10 extraordinary uh, talented kids um, who are coming over uh, a second batch this summer, and our, our students. Yeah, marvelous. Um, uh, you, by the way, your enthusiasm uh, as a teacher, really, and uh, example to, the, to young musicians is fantastic. I've seen you uh, in with concerts with the Juilliard, uh, and there they all are, and they, they it's a fantastic uh, development. Uh, here, I think, uh, well, and you love it. You love uh, the young. I do. I, you? I find music making. When you're making music with people who are discovering professional music at the very beginning, you know, who are just sort of stretching out their wings, about you know, it's irresistible, really. Mm. So our last um, um, is just a tiny example of a concert, the, the the concerts you do, which is stripped of all. Uh, design and effects, so there's no gamble there, and you've just got this, uh, these young uh, musicians and singers uh, with you conducting them on stage. I believe this is Le Jardin de Monsieur Lully, but you'll correct me if I'm wrong. So this is the last uh, uh, little video.
There we are. Luli is where we came in with our teas. Um, uh, do you have anything else to add? <laughs> no, it's been a it's been a great uh, moment. Yeah. It's been really. I'm very happy. I'm glad you. If you're happy, we're happy. So uh, I just want to thank him very much. <laughs>